So next up is JFK's uh, inaugural address in Washington, January 20th, 1961. This is another analysis for the Edexcel English Language and Literature Anthology. And so let's just go through in order and we'll pick out a few things. So, opens up with, uh, to those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away, merely to be replaced by far, by far more iron tyranny. So we can go for, let's have a look, we've got pledge, we pledge here. So this is an example of heightened language, that verb, you won't normally pledge to do things in everyday life. We don't really pledge, um, apart from pledge, the uh, the polish uh, for furniture. But anyway, that's a hilarious joke and I will move on swiftly from that. Notice that we open with a dependent clause, so we're foregrounding with a dependent clause. So those new, new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free... So, again, this contributes to this effect. It's heightened language. Um, it's above and beyond that which we use in everyday life. Um, OK, so moving on, we've got iron tyranny. That's the motive. Um, metaphorical as well, isn't it, with iron? So that's useful. Um, we should not always expect them to find them supporting our view, but we should always hope. So look at the Lexis here. we got hope. Um, to look see if there's more of a lexical set with similar things in as well um, to find them strongly supporting their own freedom and to remember that in the past those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside so that's an, allu an allusion an allusion so he's using that really as an example of something a sort of little story there that's making supporting the point that he's making and think about the persona that JFK is projecting here in this uh, speech as well. So this is an inaugural address, so this is his uh, debut, effectively, as uh, president. It's his first appearance, or uh, well, publicly, it's his first big speech as president. Um, so he wants to look statesmanlike. he's projecting an idea of he's presidential, um, and he knows what he's talking about. So we will continue with the next paragraph. To those people in the huts and villages, there's a little lexical set there, huts and villages of half the globe. But I wonder if there's a thing there which is sort of comparing, um, I suppose the, the pragmatics of this, the implication is is that Americans are lucky and they live in they live in the, in the best country. There's a kind of implication there through huts and villages. Um, uh, half the globe struggling to break the bonds metaphor again heightened language mass misery we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves and that's familiar collocation and again it's like um, he the, again the pragmatics here the implication we're not just going to go and chuck loads of money at them we want to help them out help, help them help themselves so we're going to help them out in that way to be independent then uh, for whatever period is required not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. And you may notice there is a uh, bit of a pattern there. There's an incrementum building up because it goes uh, not because, not because, but because it is right. There's a bit of parallel phrasing there, a bit of anaphora here with not because and not because. And of course, con ton context, as far as I can even say that then of uh, communists uh, of course it's the uh, cold war era so against uh, soviet russia is a uh, is in the background there as well so if a free society cannot help the many who are poor it cannot save the few who are rich that is antithesis so the sentence level opposites there so again he's using this as an example and again i say he's presenting himself as statesmanlike that he's able to help and support a lot of people uh, so he carries on to our sister republics, bit of personification there, sister republic. So again, this is working on a, on an international level. It's important language. Then again, he's pledging again. He likes his furniture polish. No, that's a, another terrible joke. But yeah, he's pledge to convert our good words into good deeds. Parallel phrasing there. Again, this isn't necessarily... This shows you that it's pre-planned, pre-prepared. It isn't necessarily the kind of language you would use in everyday life. Uh, to assist free men and free governments in casting off the chains of poverty. So again, there's more parallel phrasing. That's a metaphor, the chains of poverty there as well. 
And this is that kind of gendered thing of when you're, you know, using men to represent humans. It's used in that way sometimes. Uh, be a sign of the times as well, you might say, though, in terms of the context. Because remember, it's 1961. Obviously not now at the time of speaking, at the time JFK was speaking. So there you go. Um, Fronted conjunction there, but this peaceful revolution. So that is a slightly more informal feature. That We'll come back to that a bit later on. Notice, look, here's hope again. So, uh, abstract noun, like earlier on. Uh, cannot become the prey of hostile pa hostile powers. That is another metaphor. And again, what's he implying? Well, he's implying America is protecting from these dangerous other countries. And again, the implication being communists and, by extension, Russia. And prey, obviously, connotations of, like, uh, birds of prey and predators and the like. So let, let all our neighbours know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas and let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. So another metaphor there at the bottom and we've got um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, the front of conjunction there as well. So that's good and I'll just move up the page. Okay, so just scrolling up, there we go. So back to highlighting. Okay, so uh, to that World Assembly of Sovereign States, the United Nations, our last best hope in an age where the instruments of war have far, far outpaced the instruments of peace. War, peace, another example of antithesis. Again, this isn't necessarily how we'd speak in everyday life. It's been pre-prepared, obviously it's a planned text. Um then uh what else we're on now? Here we go. So he's doing another pledge, our pledge of support. Look, there's a pattern of this word being repeated. Uh so uh, to prevent it from merely becoming a forum for invective to strengthen its shield of the new and the weak to enlarge the area in which its writ may run. So this is all meant to be like optimistic talk. It's in his inaugural speech. Um, it's not going to be all about um, kind of angry kind of talk. It's actually going to do something. Strengthen its shield. Shield again. Connotations of defence and protection. Um, an enlarged area in which it's ri may run. This is really meaning like we're going to um, really extend our kind of good influence, our benevolent influence. Discourse marker, finally, there's lots of discourse markers here at the start of uh, paragraphs. Well, there would be paragraphs he would speak, but it's hard to tell where one begins and one ends. But of course, that's why it would be a spoken text and you would actually hear that, wouldn't you? So these, that's why the discourse markers are important. So to finally, those nations who would make themselves our adversary, as in enemy. Adversary is, again, high to the language. We wouldn't use that in everyday life normally. We offer not a pledge, oh look again, but a request uh, that both sides begin anew the quest for peace, which I think was a Superman film in the 80s, but anyway, no, so that's irrelevant. Before the dark powers of destruction, it's hyperbolic, unleashed by science, that's passive voice, so I'll come on to that in a second. Um, unleashed by science, notice the passive voice there, engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self destruction. It's weird, you know, as if nuclear weapons were a product just of science. You know, um, obviously, it's presidents, governments, military would have commissioned all these things. Yeah, science created it, but who's paying for it, you know? So, using passive voice is distancing himself um, and his government, and, you know, he's distancing himself from nuclear weapons. Oh, they exist. That's because they're a product of science. That's basically it, you know. Again, heightened language, engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. The background to this, of course, is of a very real threat of what they called in those days mutually assured destruction. You know, like one uh, one side fires off their missiles once they get angry and the other side fires off their missiles when they get angry, then it's game over for everyone. That was a real threat in this era. Uh, we dare not tempt them with weakness. For only when our arms are sufficient, beyond doubt, can we be certain, sorry, beyond doubt, that it will never be employed. So, again, there's a bit of diacopy here, beyond doubt, can we be certain, beyond doubt, that phrase is framed there for emphasis, isn't it? He's saying there in the idea of, um, you know, I'm not going to be weak, I'm going to keep this weaponry. 
and you you know it's there as a defence. Um, but neither can two great and powerful groups of nations take comfort from our present course. Both sides overburdened by the cost of modern weapons. Both rightly alarmed by the steady spread of the deadly atom metaphor. Deadly atom. It, actually, though, isn't that it, that be really a form of synecdoche, isn't it? Because the atom itself is got a part of the nuclear explosion, isn't it? It's at the heart of the nuclear explosion. So that's actually a form of synecdoche. Yet both racing to alter that uncertain balance of terror that stays the hand of mankind's final war. So here we've got this idea of, um, yeah, there's there's potential threat. I'm a man of I'm I'm a man of peace, but I'm prepared to use uh, maximum force if I need to. That's really kind of part of the voice that's coming across. One final discourse, Michael. So let us begin anew. Remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. This is really famous, this last line here. If I can actually get the thing to spin around. Or can I get it to spin around? Sometimes. There we go. Let us never negotiate a fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. So this is an example of JFK's use of um, what's known as like anti-metabolism, which is this, I always call it the Bruce Forsyth technique. It's like... Uh, Nice to see you, to see you nice, if you're familiar with that one. And it's when you flip it round. And again, that would be for emphasis at the end. And again, that would sum up what I was just saying, wasn't it? I'm a man of peace, but I'm not afraid to use weapons if I actually need to. So I'm going to stop there. hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found that useful. And there's plenty more to listen to. So thank you for listening. And goodbye. <laughs>